How you doing everyone? Welcome back to Broadcast. It's Billy Kirkwood here. I've got an amazing episode for you tonight. Thanks very much for watching wherever you are. Do me a favour, if you are watching Broadcast, wherever you are on the globe, hit that share button. Let people, as many people see as we can from the broad universe. And wherever you're watching tonight, do me a favour, hit us up in the comments. I'd love to know where you're watching us from tonight. And don't forget as well, make sure to go and check out everything that's going over at Broadbeard social media and of course broadbeardoils.com. I am so excited about our guest tonight, uh, this afternoon. Whenever you're watching it, if you're watching it in the future, congratulations. This is what we used to look like. Whenever you're watching it, uh, our guest tonight is not only an actor, a comedian. Uh, he's performed probably every type of live performance I think that is known to man, as well as being a part of a band at the Battlelands. Just, you know, there's so much to get into here, and I'm very excited to welcome an old friend. Uh, so please, ladies and gentlemen, please give it up. For the one of the Mr. Gavin Mitchell! Hey! Uh, yes! Yes! Welcome to the future. Uh, what on earth is going on? Gav, uh, we'll do that whole thing first of all where we can pretend, oh, I'm out of focus. I need to fix that. Um, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll put myself further away. There we go. Um, first of all, we'll do that whole thing that we we can pre we pretend that we were only talking for about 20 minutes before we came on. Uh, how how are you? Oh, nothing. A bullet wouldn't affect <laughs> There you go. Well, it's a you know, I, I I rushed to get here. I just had to stop at the graveyard and visit my career. Uh, that's what I did before I got on. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't even take flowers myself. I just steal other people's. Uh, I think that's where we've got to. Uh, mate, here we are in probably the most insane time in history, in our our history, I guess we should say. I, I mean, I know there was. It was old wars and all that type of thing. We can't really lay claim to that. Uh, how are you finding it? First of all, it's great to see everything that's going on in Mitchell Towers just behind you. Uh, Made yes. sure to get all the good stuff going on. That's definitely... Is that... Um, that's Thunderbirds as well. Just yeah, noticed I, behind you. I've got Tracy. I've got uh, Captain Black as well. Oh! Uh, he never I've looked got, well. I've got the hood as well. There he oh, is. bloody hell, Which you've got them all. I've, I've got to uh, get batteries because they, uh, they speak. Oh right, okay. Honestly, they do. They, <laughs> they tell me they give me they give me advice and everything. <laughs> Your plans for world domination are mistaken. <laughs> yeah, I, I collect all sorts of uh, daft toys and things. So I've got all sorts of madness around about here, old vintage tin oh, toys and I, I don't, Judge I Dreads and Captain Scarlets and childhood retro stuff. So it's. Oh, God. I wouldn't, wouldn't want to embarrass you with all the stuff that I've got. I've got a, w, <laughs> a WWE Championship belt. I've got a fart ninja that oh, someone gave me. So here we go. <laughs> I've got my... Uh, you know, I can't see him there. Fart ninja, I'll raise you. A oh. su sumo fan. <laughs> <laughs> That's the most... That is the, You know, the two things that automatically go together. Uh, I still... Man. It's just perfect for in your pocket in those hot days. And listen, when you when you're out watching two fat guys slap each other around, I think there's nothing better. <laughs> uh, I think you put the way lockdown's been. Can I help you? No, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm fr I'm from Ayrshire, so I've got quite a rare item in Ayrshire. Fire! Look at that. <laughs> um, <laughs> Nobody, nobody, give me any shit if you're watching from Ayrshire. I, I'm from here. I'm allowed to make that joke. Uh, I'm so inbred. My mum is younger than me. Right, Gav, we have got <laughs> so much to get through. We're so excited to join us here on broadcast. Thank you very much. Um, you know, it, it is a crazy time, mate. I think before we before we get too far into it, uh, how has lockdown been for you? It's the most unique time in human history, is it not? Uh, not half. I mean, uh, to be honest with you, I quite enjoyed it up to a mm. point. Um, you know, because uh, sort of mental health and all that kind of stuff that people are talking about. And I've always been quite open about my own kind of mental health issues. Yeah. And I was kind of prepared for it in a funny kind of way. Yeah. But, um, I think just that being Groundhog Day and all that became, it was easy to kind of handle it. Yeah. And it was kind of normal. So I think a lot of people who suffer from depression and anxiety have dealt with it very well. It's, it's people who have had normal lives that have freaked out a bit more going, I can't deal with this, I can't deal with that. And, and I, I, we've been kind of showing the way going, look, it's all right, here's some tips for you. <laughs> yeah. Stuff. And also being an actor and being unemployed a lot of the time, you're used to it. So, Well, as that thing is like no two days when you're, you're self-employed and you work in the creative industries, 
no two days are kind of the same. Yeah. So you're, you're almost kind of already turning into the curve and you do get those times where you're like, you're up and you're high. And then there's other times you're All like, right. I'm, I'm the worst person in the world. Oh my God. <laughs> uh, um, but it does kind of, I can understand that. It does kind of prepare. So when it does kind of slow down a little bit and you're able to go, oh, I think I might go a wee walk today. Or, uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm a... a Catching up, reading, watching movies. The same as everybody, really. Reading, watching yeah. movies. Get back into my art a bit, which was my first love. So get into yes. drawing a bit again. And uh, and my wee dog is going to save my life, my wee dog, Bob. Aww. So he's got his out and about a lot. Uh, yeah. My wee rescue dog. Um, and that's fine. But now I'm getting a bit, I, I think we're all a bit fatigued and a bit fed up and a bit over it, you know. So yeah. now I'm getting a bit stabby. <laughs> <laughs> that's the perfect description about how we're all starting to feel a bit stabby it's, I, I, it, day. Oh, I don't really know a bit stabby a bit, a bit stabby it's like oh I know <laughs> it's, <laughs> shall, shall, shall we go somewhere today for lunch that only serves soup just as a precaution <laughs> just in case <laughs> just in case uh, um, but uh, it is, is the weird thing to see how people have adapted during this I mean like I say right I've, we'll, we'll dive straight into career wise we've been very lucky on the show because I've got to talk to various different people from various different disciplines and my god like you have such a, a, a body of work going so many by I mean before we'd got to know each other and, and off the top of my head I think we first met, I want to say at Kelvin Brawl, maybe, or something like that. I want to say that might be right, or maybe we did the audio bit, but I don't think we met before then. Um, Kelvin uh -huh. Brawl, if you don't know what it was, was a, a big wrestling event that was put on here in Scotland. It featured Rab Florence, who you guys might know from Burniston, or um, writing for, uh, God, so many things, video games yeah. and, and what have you, can check that out. And he's, he's a... Soup and things, so yeah. Oh, that, that, of course, yeah. Huge wrestling fan. Uh, I think that's the first time we met, but you have uh, been a, an actor, comedy actor, serious actor, going all the way back. I mean, I, I'd known all about you going all the way back to Velvet Soup, and I think as well I saw you in, I think I went and saw the BBC, which was a channel flopping thing. I can't even remember it. Uh, there's so many different things, so many different things. Uh, where did it, where when this was off fields, no, when I, this was off fields, remember that? Remember yeah. that? Remember well, that I, was a presto. Remember that was a presto. I was, I was here when they were just starting the act. You know, I was, I was, we got a big lump of stone and we started making some acting. So I, no, I, back to the eighties, I think I started that, oh but it all God. started as a dare, really. Really? Yeah, it was a complete dare. Uh, right. I, I, I was that generation that, um, uh, you know, I was plonked in front of the telly and all that and just right. watching the tell my granny and everything with the usual kind of Scottish West Coast of Scotland dysfunctional family. My mom would run away with me or my dad would run away with me and the only constant was a, was a television. <laughs> so I used to watch Steptoe and Son and all that stuff and yeah. impersonations. I found out quite early that uh, I could make my big brother's pals laugh and thought, oh, hello, and yes. moving schools and all that a lot so i found it was the classic sort of way to stop getting kickings basically was that make people laugh be a moving target just zigzag a lot yeah uh, so that and my dad was a film projectionist so i think right. that influenced us as, as well uh and i but coming from springburn uh it wasn't the kind of life to be an actor really you know it's like you're it's Give me your get that out your head, you silly bugger. So, folk, don't, folk don't get it though. It's, <laughs> it, it's folk don't get it. It's not something in Scotland you're meant to do, particularly when you're from certain classes or certain areas. It's like you're meant to you meant to get a job in a factory. You meant to have two point five kids. You're not meant to do anything like that. So. How did you make that jump then? I mean, you're making guys laugh in the playground. You, I know you've got a great love of film as well, which I'm sure has come from, you know, your your dad and what have you. Yeah. But where, 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 what made that leap then? Was it something you got interested in school or or, or where did we go? I think I just, I, I was just quite infatuated with TV and film and things. And, and I kind of wanted to do it or harboured it. And ah. I was quite a, a, a kind of closed kid I suppose because we moved around a lot and all that I entertained mm. myself um, and I, so I guess it was always there um, but I just kind of was scared to vocalise it and then yeah. my, my later 
teen started looking into it. I thought, how would you do something like that? Yeah. And so I got a prospectus and stuff, but just never had the guts, pardon me, to see it through and thought, how do you find addition pieces? What's an addition piece? Yeah. Uh, and all that. And so as time went on, I just didn't. I kept bottling it, basically, and did right. other things. And then one night I was at a party, me and my best mate at the time, me and Muir, were both unemployed, didn't know where we were going in life, kicking about doing various odds and sods. Right. And we were at somebody's party, at, uh, quite, we'd, we'd, we'd salt your intelligence, we'd had a wee drink. And, uh, and Ian said, he, he'd been a joiner, but never finished his apprenticeship, as you right. got in those days. He said, they've asked me, to, he'd get a foot in the door at the Citizens Theatre. Right. Carpentry work. And they said, uh, would, would you be an extra in the next show? And, and Ian was like, what? And had absolutely no <laughs> uh, dreams of stage or anything like that. <laughs> Ian was a terrible mumbler as well. He was like, I right. don't want to go. And I was like, oh, what? Are they looking for anybody else? So um, that was that. He said, well, if, if you do it, I'll do it. And we went, okay. And we shook on it. And I'd been in the theatre a couple of times. And okay. And they'd spotted me. I did some casual painting work and stuff because originally I painted a lot and stuff. So yeah. I'd done scenery work. And uh, and I had the kind of look then. I was slim, believe it or not, and had uh, a head full of hair then. And I was peely wally. And that was the kind of citizen's look, was being kind of white, <laughs> dark haired, and thin. It was all still is, of... to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, and that's how it started. So it was a dare, really. And then I was paranoid for years that you're untrained and, right. and some people taking joy out at pointing out. You can tell you've not trained the way you move, your voice, all that nonsense. But as time went on, I thought it's utter nonsense. It's, it's mm. horses for courses, you know. It used to be a closed shop, but I think I'm more a watcher and an observer and I learned on the job, really. And I think yeah. even if I had went to drama college, I probably would have hated it. It just wouldn't have been for me. I'd have rebelled against it, I think, the authority and being told how to do something. Because a lot of art, whether it be painting or acting, how do you tell somebody to do it? You know, Yeah, it's almost thought. like deprogramming who you oh, are right. and how you learn. Exactly. Um, I'm taking nothing away from anyone that is learning well, drama or, 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 or going that type of thing. But I think in, in, we all know the voice. <laughs> we all know the voice that uh, it, it can bring out of you in drama school but it, I mean you've one of the things from you can see it from the diversity of work there's real colour within even the the spectrum of what you're doing I mean you're you're going between comedy and drama so everything you learned realistically was it was it on the job uh, yeah yeah I've never really been taught anything it's just and I never I've never ever had a plan um at all I've just bumbled you know everybody yeah. sort of kind of surfed the wave a wee bit and Especially in earlier years, I thought, oh, my God, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? I'm going to have to get a real job or oh, this isn't going to last. And then <gasps> something appears. You go, oh, thank God, I'll keep, I'll keep going. You know, And I've, I've just kind of went for there to there to there. And, and yeah. would have been lucky enough to like, and, and this, a lot of people find this a terrible thing to say, but I'd rather be skint than do something I don't want to do. Hmm. Uh, and uh, so, thankfully, most of the time I've been lucky enough to do things because I'm interested and I like yeah. it. And there's something there that it's different. You know, it's, you know, bless people who do 95s, but I've not really had to. Um, and and that's what I like about it, that it's it's variety, you know, it's rather, but you built a career as a, you know, an incredible sort of serious actor. No. I kind of went, no, I don't want to do that. No, I, I want to go over here. And, you know, and a lot of people would say, well, that's crazy. You should have built on this and you could have been and you should have been and you've missed oh. opportunities. And a lot of that's possibly true, but I find it far more in enjoyable and interesting not knowing what's coming next and sort of bouncing around various different things and going, Aye, why not? Let's give that a bash. That sounds a laugh. You know? Yeah. And, and again, if you're someone that's learning on the job, getting all these new experiences, stage time, stage time, just more and more and more. I, isn't that a bit? Isn't that what they kind of should are kind of teaching you to do, but they're not well, doing at the same time? You know, because as I said, you know, as we both said, horses for courses, and I think yeah. you know, people out there who have trained magnificent actors, there's people who have trained who are, you know, and um, there's people who are untrained, brilliant actors. There's people who are untrained who are also garbage actors. So, yeah. But the thing I find hard about it, looking back on it now, is if you're going to act, surely it's about experience. Yeah. And if there's people who are going to do things at 16, 17, and they're being asked to, you know, 
play god knows you know parts that take life experience or yeah. you know, or emotional experience that they've not encountered yet yeah. are you really going to get that for your textbook or, or sitting in a classroom where I, i'm sorry to say but a failed actor a lot of the time yeah. teaching you but- um, I I I did a uh, I did media I did a uh, TV and film production at university. Uh, now I make my job as a now I make my living as a comedian, which is kind of weird. <laughs> but, uh, but but even then, to take your point, it's like you are you know, I've got someone there that's going. I'm going to tell you everything I did, but not I'm going to tell you everything I did so you can learn from the mistakes. I'm telling uh, yeah. you everything I did, and this is the part. This is it. This is the course. Uh, w- and then you get a job in TV. Why well, did I get a job in TV? Well, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I never, made it. <laughs> yeah, I never made it. Like I, I remember we got I, I would say Dr. David Dunn, if you're listening, three double triple D's, good on you. Uh, but he <laughs> his biggest thing was that he had directed Crossroads. And I just remember thinking, what the fuck am I doing listening to a guy that directed Crossroads? Do you know what I mean? I, I want to be out there remaking the evil dead in the forest or something, you know? I want to be out there being silly and making every mistake I can. But I've got to ask you, like, in terms of where we are now with Scotland, with film, theatre and television, what was it like back in the, the, the 80s and 90s? Because it was a, it would have been a very different place because, I mean, you talked there about trying to find a prospectus. You had to go to a library. You had to send uh-huh. away to get a prospectus. I mean, you just couldn't go to the internet and find out how it was done or, or you know, get put a showreel out there and, you know, hopefully people would find it. What, what was the type of work that you were able to pursue or, or, or bumble into, as you say? Well, it was, uh, very, it was very, very different. Um, I mean, I actually can't, it was that long ago, I can't remember, Billy. Oh, was, well, it comes in us all. <laughs> at the time, who... who looked into it for me and went to the RSAMD that as it was called then before it's um, uh, what, what, what was it called now that they spent thousands to change the name is it the RSAMD <laughs> or something <laughs> the Royal Scottish Conservatoire <laughs> um, so yeah and got me this prospectus but apart from that the other the, the other main thing that people I don't think realise nowadays is the whole closed shop thing which was you had to have an equity card yeah. work then so when I started uh, you either I, I can't remember all the details now you, you'd have to get into comedy or a variety act or something like that it was one way to earn it so you right. get so many live performances under your belt I think it was maybe 16 or something or okay. maybe into the 30s or something so you, people had to create their own thing you try and get a book stamped or show proof receipts of some sort go there you go and take it to the union and the union would go mm, way up well okay you can officially be a member of the union now which oh, would I hate then, stuff like that i hate <laughs> stuff like that <laughs> would then allow you to go on a stage uh or i think some theaters were given like two cards a year and it was like gold dust so people would try and get in these theaters and some people hoping that somehow through that they'd be good enough and it would they'd be deemed to be given the equity card. But still, that wasn't good enough for some places. Pardon yeah. me. If you want it to work down south in the West End or something like that, you needed a higher level of equity card. And you had to prove that you'd, you'd actually acted on a stage for however long, how many months or whatever. And then that was deemed you were then allowed on to the West End stage. And all that. So, so there was all sorts of rules. And you can see why... Uh, a lot of people hated actors or the pretension of them, you know, which I found certainly in those days being at the sets, uh, mm-hmm. because it was a lot of English actors, it gave right. me the kind of weird idea of what acting was about. So there was all these actors for London and stuff who were, who were were really good to me and still friends to this day, who were, who were beautiful. No, 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 dear boy, keep your hand in your pocket and <laughs> buying your drinks and all the rest of them. We're going to supper, you know, and they'd be going to Regano's for some eating. They seem to live this amazing lifestyle, and they came over like these kind of rakish, wildy and fox or something, you know, who drank and caroused, and this amazing idea of being an actor. And, and you know, if you're ever in London, please come and visit. You must look me up, give me a phone. I'm, oh, I thank you very much. I cheers, I will, you know. And there's, a thought, World, there's a World Cup coming up. I'll be there. <laughs> <laughs> And I'd, I'd look these guys up and go down and then realise that they're skinned. Down in London, they were skinned. Yeah. They, they were unemployed. They weren't answering their phones because they were scared that it was their accountant. They were lying in their bed till four in the afternoon and all that. And like, hold on, but up the road, they're like, oh, you know, yeah. this Falstaffian lifestyle. 
and that's like, oh, right. So it was quite a lot of bullshit being applied. And then I, I then went to, I get my equity card through the sets. Right. They gave me a card one year. And of course, just as I got my equity card, the rules changed. And anybody could be involved. So I'd worked all these years to try and get the equity card, got it, and it was completely invalid, and anybody could do it. And you're like, oh, Jesus. And then I became part of the establishment that, that kind of I was complaining about because suddenly I'm going, so you can just walk in a pub and he could get my job. <laughs> <laughs> this is ridiculous. This must be stopped. Uh, and then I went to Rain Dog Theatre Company, Bobby Carlyle's Theatre Company. Yeah. And they worked from Washington Street Art Centre in Glasgow, which sadly closed now. Yeah, and I get in there for the first time. We were doing a version of One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, was their first production. And I walked in and there was two guys sitting in a wee makeshift canteen they'd made. And they were talking about football and all that. And uh, they were talking about the game. And, and one of them talked about the big Indies car being gone and all that. And I thought, obviously technicians. <laughs> 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 And then I realised they were actors. And I thought, what? So you can be Glaswegian and talk your own accent and be an actor? Because I've been in this weird goldfish bowl with the Citizens Theatre. And I'll the take this velvet bus. jacket off straight away. <laughs> oh, don't your back. <laughs> oh, please, my hat, my cane. I shall need it no more. Get me a Celtic tap. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I guess it, you think the sets was in the heart of the gorbals, but yeah. that's quite sort of. Uh, world renowned sort of theatre, but incredibly sort of false ideas of, of what it gave you about what acting was. And then the next thing, the opposite end of the extreme, there's people almost outdoing each other for like, what scheme did you come from? Right. <laughs> you know, how rough are you? No, like, all right, okay. So, um, so I, it was very, very different. And even to also to talk in Scots then was weird. Yeah, yeah. And so that's so what was unusual about Rain Dog, you know, so to talk in your own accent. And what we did when we first had some that one flew over the cuckoo's nest was uh, to talk over each other, to interrupt each other, to talk naturally. Uh, right. Uh, uh, which just didn't happen before. No. You know, if you, if you look back, first of all, people had that weird Scots, which you still see on tell. If you look at old episodes of Take the High Road, it's that strangely affected Scots that people have. Or even when they're angry, if you come over here, I'll punch you right in the jaw in a minute. I'll rip your jaw. <laughs> well, it did slash me. <laughs> you know, weird, uh, I hope Gerald Butler's watching. That's all I've got to say. I hope <laughs> Gerald Butler's watching. What do you call it? Or oh, what's her face with Bells Hill? The uh, ninety-five. The singer. He's got that weird Amer American Scots. Thing oh, the uh, well, Gloria. No, it's not Gloria oh, Estefan. Oh, oh. Gloria Estefan. I know you. What's her name? Oh, Gina Easton. Gina Easton, thank you. you know. She Gloria oh, Estefan. She looked for messages and I just tripped right over the sidewalk. <laughs> oh, mind you're heating the windy. Oh, God. Uh, it's... It was completely different times for things like that. And, and yeah. they were quite revolutionary that way. You know, take yeah. that, also to take a film and put it on stage and to do it in, uh, do it in Scots and I to change rhythm patterns. And stuff and bring music in as well. A lot of the music we used. Um, so I and people were like, Oh my god! And and also, this was starting, to, you're then starting to come into the times of early that time, it was you're moving in early 90s as well. Yeah, at that point, we were hitting things like rave culture, uh, and uh, train spotting. Uh, yeah, Irvin's a good pal, and Irvin was writing train spotting. Now, I remember Irvin had written this book, and we didn't know what it was. No, I remember somebody said, Irvin's got a publisher. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good for him. Smash. Oh, smashing great news. Great news. Great news. It's a weird title. Um, so all these things came that kind of gathered as well, that, that kind of changed how we were looking at things, I think. I mean, yeah. one of the posters, I've not got it about here, but Bobby Carlyle and I did a poster for... We did a version of the show called um, Conquest of South Pole, and Bobby and I designed the poster. And it's Bobby wearing a, you know, a dust mask with, right. with a parka. And, and people used to nick the poster all the time because it just kind of locked into kind of rave culture. And people oh, of were course. Just yeah. wearing masks and kind of sniffing stuff and what have you. Um, so I, that kind of all 
so it's built this new kind of confidence was starting to appear uh, about Scotland and acting and, and uh, yeah. adult voices and uh, it all kind of was slowly kind of coming together and changing. Because you know? I mean, obviously we like we'd seen in like the the seventies and the eighties, you would have had like play of the day and stuff that was being Dear produced in school. Yeah, yeah, it, but it wasn't really. You're right; it did seem to be opening up. Even the nineties, talking about. Uh, um, I'll call him Bobby. I don't know him. Uh, but, uh, like, so Bobby, my mate Bobby Carlyle uh, was doing, like, say, Hamish Macbeth and what have oh, yeah. you. And even BBC Scotland had gone back to trying to produce, like, some of their own comedy content. Uh, it did seem to be that there was a new wave, like you say, a new confidence that was almost coming up. Oh, yeah. That was really in place in Glasgow. Someone like me that was a little out in the sticks, you would get to see flavours of it. So... Right about this time, what what are you thinking in terms of? Because, like you say, you're you're being hungry. You're you're you know you're going after things, or or things are coming your way. Are you starting to feel a vein for anything in particular? You're going to where did you make the the jump back into comedy, so to speak? Because I'm hearing about elements of serious acting, and I'm hearing about you doing little bits, but there seem to be a vein there where you plugged into almost the 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 comedy scene. No, not really. I think. I, again, it's like I say, I just was all over the place. I never ever had a plan. Uh, it was straight acting that I did at the sets, really. It was all right. classics and what have you. Although I, I would end up kind of, my, my sort of default position's always been comedy, but I think that's been yeah. a defense mechanism. So right. I, I kind of end up doing kind of comic roles in the sets. Mm. Or we would add things, you know, I'd be like a, a kind of butler. And somebody would whisper something in my ear, ear during rehearsals as a dare, you know, and do hey, this just for a laugh, see what happens. And I would do a crazy pratfall as I announced somebody come in or something like that. And just anything to get a cheap laugh, I was terrible, you know. But there's comedy in real life. There's comedy even in the most tragic, you know, even oh, in the most yeah. tragic, dramatic circumstance. I mean, I, I shot myself on a seesaw three weeks ago, but I didn't need to tell you that. <laughs> um, uh, but you know what I mean. There's always some something that'll happen, and I won't even tell you what. Listen, my father-in-law nearly pegged himself on a bit of fence outside, and that was one of the funniest things I'd ever seen. <laughs> Especially as he bent down and his the tone changed. <laughs> uh, <woo>! uh, <laughs> I didn't think I was going to be a part of his first experience like that, but clearly it was. But there is a lot. Of, uh, there is a lot of humour in oh, in yeah. real life. Do you think that prepared you? Because even though. I mean, you, you've said it yourself. You get actors that cannot do comedy. They cannot have an element of improvisational timing, you know, that uh, off kilter. Uh, but you were you were able to bring that. Do you think that helped your career? Possibly, I think so. I think I'm making people laugh, or survival instinct, or defense mechanism always does. And I think that I that has been my go-to. But I don't yeah. think I recognised that or was aware of it, or. Conscious of it, I think it was just something I fell back on all the time. Oh, yeah. trouble! Make them laugh, make them laugh. You don't realise you're doing it, and so yeah. I, you know. So in the sets, I think I was a kind of um, some kind of mascot in a way. I wasn't a traditional actor, and I think that the sort of the the people at the top, like Giles Havergill and stuff, thought, you know, I don't know why we employ him, but I, I sort of like him. <laughs> <I'm> around. <laughs> Um, and then I'd go to Rain Dog, and then we started doing. I think we did John Burns um, Slab Boys. Oh, and right. We, we did the whole, all, almost the whole trilogy in one at Element Solid and one show. And I met uh, Andy Gray, Gerard Kelly, and, and David Heyman. So meeting people like that, I think, were my first kind of meeting Scottish sort of funny people. Yeah. Like, uh, so there was a bit of that, and then people who were coming to see the show were people like Robbie Coltrane and. And, and friends of the heirs and things. So people had spotted me, but I didn't know this. Uh, and again, because the one thing I would say that's good about drama school is connections and people knowing each other, who you get in touch with and all that kind of thing. I was just like, oh, uh, what, what do you do? How do you, I don't know how you do stuff. Pardon me. And people would say, you should get in touch with and like, who's that? You know, why? Oh, okay. And how do I do that? Well, I send your CV and headshot, a CV and headshot. <laughs> so it was constantly learning on the job. But no, I, there was no plan. I bumbled. I think uh, the next thing was, I think somebody saw me uh, during that and I did Parahandi or something. I had a wee part. Oh, my um, God. But, but also all these things, you know, I always had different connections and different things because there was no plan, you know, because yeah. I've, I've always loved music. 
I've always loved musicians, but I don't play anything. So right. I think you know, actors always want to be musicians, musicians always want to be actors. Um, so all that kind of stuff. And and I've, it's just been a kind of scattergun approach, Billy, all the time. You know, I just, uh, as I say, kind of, I just bumbled along. And then Scotland being Scotland, it's quite a wee village anyway. So you, you kind of connect again or come yeah. back around in each other and stuff, you know. Your name will come up somewhere. If you're doing something right, your name Aye. will come up somewhere. Um, so uh, all this stage background, we, you know, we'll come back to the, the stage stuff certainly in a little minute. Where did what was the first TV job? Was it an advert? Was it anything small, anything big? I mean, you mentioned Para Handy. For anyone that's watching, I believe that's the the remake they did with Gregor Fisher. Oh, that's remake. right. Yeah. Do you do no. a remake? We'll call it a remake. A, the the remake well, they did in the nineties. Three. Yeah. Was Para Handy actually? Um, yeah, there was another one, wasn't there? There was a. Uh, it's been made. I can't. Gosh, I can't remember. Everybody says Roddy McMillan, but there was one before Roddy McMillan, and then there was oh, one was. after Roddy McMillan. And, Oh, there's tons of them. Um, not my first ever job, funnily enough, was, was a really <laughs> weird one that happened through the sets. Okay. And it was one of those, you should get in touch with such and such. Okay. Right. Um, and I think the, the other interesting thing is, I think because I didn't know how things worked, it, st- it, it kept me in good stead. So I was going to auditions or going to things, and I didn't know the rules. Right. So I just was in being myself, really. And I think... That worked for you or worked against you because people were you were a breath of fresh air or who is this guy, uh, or other people just thought who is this guy, <laughs> you know? I, who, who does he think he is? Or what? Yeah. He's not playing to the rules. But, but the then they might remember I, you in that next one, uh, that next project down the line, you know. And I did it. It was my first one was a live studio audience uh, television when STV used to do live studio audiences, and it was yeah. a thing called My Dead Dad. Oh God, my dead dad with Forbes Mason. Aye. <laughs> <laughs> I I only remember seeing the adverts for them looking for members of the audience, but I never saw an episode, did all fairness. <laughs> I never saw an episode. Oh God. Maybe, it's maybe on YouTube or something, but uh, I did that, an episode of that, where I played a waiter who was meant to be a waiter of a, a, an old football player that old, owned a restaurant. And we had the restaurant live on stage. And, and my joke was that I was this French waiter. And then at the very, very end, Forbes can't pay the bill and, and feigns a heart attack. And I freak out and I come out this broad Glaswegian and that was the guy. But they had people like Ali McLeod was there, Gordon McQueen, uh, gosh, who else? It was just a whole host of all these famous footballers. And I hate football. <laughs> so it was really, for a lot of people, it would have been a dream. But I'm sitting in the green room like that. Who are these people? And Fred, it was where I first met Fred Macaulay as well. Fred was the warm up man. I was about to say, I bet you studio warm up. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, Fred was saying to me, he was like, How are you? And I was like, Oh, I'm quite nervous. I've never done this before and all that. Right. And he was Ah, well, I'm, I'm an accountant and I'm just starting to get into a bit of stand up. <laughs> so, so, uh, um, so that was my, uh, my first ever. So it was a, a, a good kind of baptism of fire as well. In front of that, that combination of live studio audience, but you're doing a telly. You know, how do you play it and where do you play it to? And asking actors, like, have you any tips? You know, and less is more. You know, just don't do much when you're on a camera. It's totally different for theatre acting. And uh, God, if I saw it now, I, I took it literally. I look like a lump of wood, you know, sponsored oh. by the Forestry Commission. I'm just like, uh, <laughs> oh, it's a pure like if you do anything on but I, I guess that's why I'm quite happy. I really only have one gear to be honest. <laughs> but but any time I've ever worked in it, like my like if I do any if I have a presenting style, it's far from subtle. I can assure you that. <laughs> um, but um, but acting, yeah, acting on screens are completely different kettle of fish. Uh, and back then, I mean, like you say, back in the day, I mean, STV here in in um, in Scotland for people that won't know is the equivalent of ITV. Um, yeah. But we used to do, just like you guys would, big t- well, big TV productions. Like, so the Funny Farm was probably, yeah. Funny Farm and My Dead Dad were probably the two things STV did. <laughs> that that and Hogmanay. Aye, aye. Thank you, Mick Jacob. Thank you, Mick Jacob. Oh, God. <laughs> uh, uh, an interview with Stanley Baxter every now and then. That's about <laughs> as far as we would get to do. Uh, but it's a completely different discipline. So from that first experience... Uh, and for my dad, which I can't believe I've just suddenly remembered, his dad was a big tall fella with a kind of Terry Nutkins haircut and orange hair. I remember. Back, uh, Roy Scanlon. That's who ah, right, right, right. I went, right. I went on to work with Roy later on, which was then uh, my first big ish telly. It was a thing called Taking Over the Asylum. And Roy was in that. 
uh, taking over the sound was David Tennant's big break. Yes. And um, Ken Stott. Uh, and I, Roy Hanlon was in that as well. Great actor, very funny man. He was brilliant. Uh, yeah. He played Forbes' dad. It was great. Uh, yeah, because I remember there being a bit where uh, he finds out he's got a... He's got a psychic link with his son while he's chatting to a woman. Right, they kind of link through their stomach or something. It's almost like this psychic. Yeah. Really cord, and if they get too far away, they kind of bore. Yeah, basically it was Bluetooth. It was Bluetooth. <laughs> <laughs> like, and he's trying to tell Forbes Mason, oh, you're talking to her, quick. Put your tongue in her mouth. <laughs> it's funny. Like, we, we might be making it sound slightly funnier than it was, but <laughs> um, I don't know. there wasn't a second season or series, no. if you like, put it that way. Well, it was a stage play. That was the thing. It yeah. It stretched to a six part series, you know. Oh, man, that's yeah. crazy. Well, we're talking about yeah, getting into the, the, the comedy side of things a little more. Um, it would be all of us, and I know there'll be people watching want to know. We will get back to the stage acting and all the other work. I've got so many questions. I don't know if we'll get it into a, a one-part thing. I'm going to say that right now. Uh, I've got so many questions about all the other stuff. But we have to talk about... Um, we have to talk about Still Game. We'll, uh, we'll have a launch. Never, me neither. <laughs> not, not a fan. <laughs> no, it's... <laughs> I'm a <monster>. <laughs> <laughs> We've got to talk a little bit about Still Game, or more your journey into Still Game. I, I would like to have a a, a wee chat about because uh, you're saying about it's making connections. We knew it was a for those that don't know, it was a it was a stage play. It, it kicked things off as a stage play. How did you get involved with? Uh, would have been Ford and Greg. How how did you guys? So, well, again, funnily enough, it would have been ninety six. Right. And, uh, Greg, first of all, it was a thing called um, Pulp Video. Pulp it's Video. Like... <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I had questions about Pulp Video, but I'm delighted you brought it up because we all thought it was a sequel to Naked amazing. Video. Or something. I had to say words for them. Oh, no, that was, I, 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 I just remember that there was Naked Video and then that went off the air and then a couple of years later there was Pulp Video. And I remember being a Naked Video fan being very excited. This is like the sequel. This is like the sequel. And, so, uh, we, we did a pilot. Uh, we auditioned for that, then we did a pilot, and then eventually they changed the team a bit and all the rest, and we did a series. Uh, mm. And Ford came in, I can't know if it was the pilot or something, he came in to play a couple of things, and then he came in on the series, he did a character, a DJ called Larry Logan, and a couple of other bits and bobs. And during the out of boredom, well, Greg and I played these two old men right. in a couple of sketches, one of them being uh, down in Ayrshire, funnily enough. Uh, and we were sitting at a, a, a play park eating ice cream, right. and Greg's going, you know, the bloody music's changed so much now, you know, you've got your jazz, you've got your acid jazz, you've got your dub, you've got your reggae dub, you've got your house. And, and this list went on and on and on. Well, he's doing it, I'm just licking the cone and licking the cone, and the punchline was eventually I just turned around and go, I, I know. I only know which drugs to take with which. Um, and we did another couple of things, and it was Ford said, you know, there's something in these guys and these old guys. Right. Uh, and I don't know if Greg and Ford wrote it, or it was just Ford, but he came in and there was these two sketches, and and we did, again, those were in front of a live studio audience, uh, and that was the kind of creation of the characters. I was originally Winston. Right. Uh, but Winston, my Winston was very different. He was a really shaky, doddery old guy. You can get that on YouTube and you'll see the difference. Yeah. Um, but the, the one thing I do remember about that is when we walked in front of a live studio audience, Alan Tyler was the warm-up guy. Oh. And and we were waiting in lights or set being sorted or something like that. And the three has just started ad libbing to the audience. Uh, right. as these old men and we just realized it was utterly brilliant we could get away with utter filth and nonsense <laughs> because we were old men you know <laughs> and we were loving it making each other howl we're like, this is terrific there's something in this yeah and wrote the stage play i was doing it up to the last minute but i was doing a I was doing a kids telly show at the time right with, well, enough michael hines who then went on to do uh, still game was directing um so i couldn't do it uh, I had to pull out, and Paul Riley came in and became Winston, and the rest was history, really. Mm -hmm. I went on to do Velvet Soup. The boys went on to do Tune the Fart. Yep. Uh, and then it kind of came together. I was doing another thing called Snoddy, and they asked me to come in audition for... It's a policeman uh, thing. Police... Aye, with Gregor. Yeah. Pressure. Um, yeah. We don't talk about... <laughs> <laughs> 
and then the boys asked me to audition for Still Game, uh, the buggers, because it was all kind of the parts got to be right and it's got to be this and it's got to be that. <laughs> I'm like, what? And I was literally working downstairs in the comedy unit, and they got me upstairs for an audition, and I thought, I've done tons of things. I've done, for <laughs> I've done the Baldy Man. We've done, you know, punk video. We've done, done loads of stuff. Nisbet, and you've got me auditioning to play a barman. That's a bit, you know. Ego was a bit insulted, and uh, and it turned out it was a wind up. There was nobody else at all up for the part. Ah. <laughs> Just them um, uh, making me jump through hoops with them. Like, oh, look, we've been doing all right for ourselves. Like, oh, thanks, guys. So, <laughs> Uh, I, because originally it was Billy McElhaney, who used to be in River City, played Bobby. Right. Uh, but he got a Irvin Welsh theatre show down south co- called, beautifully, You'll Have Hid Your Hole. <laughs> it was gone. <cool. laughs> Sometimes you wonder what the rest of the planet must make of us. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to see a production of You'll Have Hid Your Hole. Yeah. It's, or even like, it's like, well, make sure you're not too Scottish. Well, what's the name of this? Up Your Shaft. <laughs> it's like, fantastic. Stick the kettle on. Yeah, try not to be too Scottish. Put this kilt on, would you? <laughs> no bother. Um, so that left the opening me, and then I came, and I became Bobby. And then it changed a lot. I think that's where the two pint ship crack and all that kind of came for a wee bit. It was the boys kind of got sticking it to me a wee bit. Um... And then his time went on that slightly backfired because people kind of started to like him and felt sorry for him. You yeah. Know, walking about, an old woman would come up to you, your son, you know, it's terrible the way they they treat you and talk to you. <laughs> you, know, you know, so I was getting loads of old granny hugs in the streets and stuff. Um, and then as time went on, you realise Bobby's quite a good guy as well. Uh, he cares about them. Uh, yeah. He cares about them all. Really. He's got a heart of gold when they say any harm come to them. I always yeah. think, the best kind of thing about Bobby is it's the episode where uh, they've got Jim Watt and Bobby yeah. and Stevie are fighting over Jim Watt's daughter. Uh, and when they come to take the, the bets on the fight and Jack says to Victor, he's like, well, you're betting on Bobby, but Bobby's a wanker. And, and Victor says, aye, but he's our wanker. And, and that's kind of Bobby, really, you know. Yeah, kind of yeah, yeah. Our wanker. It, <laughs> so, because yeah. they became like... Um... It became an extended family. It was a, it was an example of what we'll see in the streets in every pub and every close and every uh, uh, you know estate all across right. Scotland. Uh, there is a Bobby, there is a Jack, there is a Victor. Uh, you know, these, well, there's always those things. The family, because it is on Netflix and what have you. I've been amazed, you know, that I've been spotted in various places and uh, and people who have come up to me, you know, and I've been spotted like Paris, Barbados, the state. But in, during the end of the festival, a woman came up to me babbling, and I was like, fucking hell, what's that? She's like pulling at me, and I couldn't make out a word she was saying. I was like, what's this? What's this? And a guy came around next to me and said, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, she's Brazilian. And she's like, do you still game fan? I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. You know, she calmed down and eventually started explaining how much she loved the show, and her mum loved the show, and how they'd learned English from the show, and, uh, you know, my mum, she'd say hello, she'd say cheerio, she'd say Two pints, prick. I'm like, oh, ah, that's funny. Then all you need. That's all you need to know in the English language, darling. Hey, Welcome listen, to Listen, imagine they're going to do a Brazilian remake and <laughs> you're the only member of the original cast that they kept. There it is, this brilliant bar next to this gorgeous ocean. <laughs> <laughs> all oh, these yeah. wonderful Brazilian actors. Bobby, <laughs> just like that. <laughs> We'd love to see that. The ballot and everything. Ah, you wouldn't have to change much. I mean, obviously you've had all these other little... Uh, well, I don't want to say little. You've had all these other little bits of success that have all built to other things. So it's these these almost two parallel careers. Because in terms of, like, still game, it's become such a... a I mean, as Rab C. Nesbitt did maybe to, to my generation. Yeah. Because uh, I remember being a... Being a I'm not one age myself here, but being a primary school and there's a there's a Scottish show on the telly. Yeah. You know, it was a big thing. Like even growing up with my brothers, we would watch absolutely Scottish voices on the TV was huge. And your your ten and nine year olds that experienced still game then got to experience it again a decade later and then took their kids, you know, to go and see it at the hydro. It became such a a cultural thing. What was that like from from your point of view? And and really it's for an entire country to embrace it, it's uh, it's I, it's crazy. 
I still, uh, to be honest with you, Billy, don't comprehend it, no. really. Because you try and think about it, your head kind of explodes. <laughs> it's really hard to get your head around because I'm exactly the same as you, but although older. So I go back to the things we were talking about earlier about play for today and things. And every yeah. generation has those things where, you know, Peter McDougall's uh, just a boys' game. We were going to school the next day going, Your tea's out, MacArthur, eh? <laughs> uh, or, you know, some David, the generation that watched Nisbet would go into school and quote Rab and all that. Oh, yeah. Then people were quoting chewing the fat. Now people, you know, will still quote still game, or people turn and go, wait a minute, sir. excuse me a minute, Bobby, wait till you see this, and they'll get their Wayne to say late lights. <laughs> you know, I was in a, in Glasgow Airport, and I met an old uh, an old pal from school I hadn't seen in donkey's years, and he got his two kids to act out scenes, and one of them was about five or six, the other was about seven or eight, and they're like, oh yeah, prick, and all that. <laughs> A, a but, buddy of mine's likened it to um, to Faulty Towers, and I, I went, "What do you mean by that?" And I mean, it is something that just seems to be ageless. It just it it's it, it seems to keep. It, you get the feeling it's going to keep rolling, even though obviously you guys aren't making any new episodes and you're not doing any live thing. But before you guys came back from that, well, we say second run. <laughs> uh, when you did those couple of new series, um, it was still like you say, it found its way on DVD. It found a whole well, new audience on DVD. I think again, I think it was just perfect storm of circumstances. I think yeah. because it was a slow grower still game. You know, it wasn't yeah. an instant hit at all when it first came out. Didn't have a huge audience. I think it it just slowly, slowly built up, and it was by about the, maybe the third series it was starting to really pick up. And then it sort of took off, and then DVDs were were starting to sell and come out then, and it kind of picked up on that. And you would meet a lot of people who were going on holiday and all that, going, "Oh, we were just watching you in Thailand." I'm like what? You know, we're on holiday, we, we take it away, and at night we'd all watch still game and all that. Such a Scottish thing to do, isn't it? We're on the other side <laughs> of the planet, it's like, well, we better put something Scottish on, otherwise... Uh, well, take the still game DVD with his mother. <laughs> here, here we are in the Caribbean, what are we having for dinner? Sausage, egg and chips. It's, <laughs> it's just that idea. I'll not be going anywhere, uh, listen, I'll not be going anywhere in the Arctic till I get a full Scottish breakfast, I'll tell you that. <laughs> Neat <doing>? Scott. <laughs> Um, so I was, it was all, all these kind of things. So it slowly, slowly built up, um, uh, unbeknownst to us just how much it was. Yeah. So much so that when we did sort of have that break, uh, and people thought we're exaggerating, but every single day for what, seven years, nine years before we're back on telly, wow. people would go, he's coming back when he's coming back, when he's coming back, when he's coming back. Oh, come on, come on. And uh, I, without fail, or still to this day, I mean, it's virtually impossible to go out that some point in the day somebody's going to say to pinch a prick or shout <laughs> Bobby, you know, and you think it's nearly 20 years, you know, it, it, it's it's mad. And I always think it's summed up with, when we did come back and people, we couldn't believe that response, you know, it was maybe four nights at the Hydro and I remember saying to Paul that plays uh, Winston, you know, I was like, Paul, do you think we can do this? You know, because my agent at the time, no longer my agent, <laughs> Take that, whoever he asks. <laughs> uh, I mean, Gavin, seriously, do you think you can play the Hydro? Because it's it's a very big room and all that. And I was like, well, I think so, I. You know, I, I, I kind of think there's enough goodwill that we can do a gig, you know. And then when I heard we're doing four, I thought, ooh. You know. And then within however many days it was, we were up to 21 the first run. That's crazy. Which was mind-blowing for everybody. None of us could get our head around that. It was just in insane. I, I don't think that'll nobody ever was happen again. Number of gigs, uh, and nobody yeah. had ever done anything like that before either. The yeah. kind of theatre show on that scale. So so that was mind-blowing. But somebody tweeted us at one point just saying, now do you see how much we missed you? Oh. And and I thought that was really beautiful. And, and, and those things, once you connected live on that scale, and it sounds really corny, but it's true. But that amount of kind of love coming back to you in the room yeah. and the stand innovations every night are just like, oh my God, it, it really kind of freaked your head out quite a bit. You thought, yeah. I never quite realised just what we, how important we were or touch people so much. You know, it's quite weird. I don't think that'll ever happen again. Like shows, like particularly in Scotland, it would tend to be when something's finished, 
It's finished. Yeah. Like, it doesn't come back. We And like you say, maybe it was that perfect storm of, you know, DVD sales and the internet and these new things getting crazy. Because then you started seeing, and I'm only comparing it like, so to, uh, you saw Family Guy coming back and Futurama coming back. And, and also, and, the other thing is, you know yourself that, in, you know, you get involved in projects and you say to people, so what, what what's this aimed at? Who, what's this, uh, you know? And well, we're looking at a kind of target audience of kind of five year olds to 95 year olds. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, <laughs> pretty broad then. And so, and you're always looking for the audience that they don't have because they can't be asked with telly, they're out enjoying themselves or they're doing this, that, and the other. And, and I agree that I don't think things will happen again because TV fundamentally has changed now. You know, you can watch it whenever you want, there's so many other ways to watch it, and you've got Netflix, etc. But also, if you knew how to do these things, we'd all be doing it. You could, you could yeah. bottle it. And I think none has realised just how big Still Game was going to be and that it would become a kind of family watching thing. You know, yeah. from, from grandchildren right through to grandparents and parents. Not that everybody sat and watched it, which is, it's hard to think of many shows that people will do that strictly. <laughs> but <laughs> maybe... But um, aye, so I think that was the other thing that worked in our favour, that, it, it, that it, it kind of gelled people. It, it was quite inclusive that way, you know. Yeah. How, how was it to, because I think any actor, any performer, any writer very rarely gets to see the whole arc of a story, gets to see the whole arc of a character. I mean, obviously, yeah, you guys went to the Hydro, became huge again, but then for there to be an end game. Yeah, of, of of sorts. Unless we end up doing a uh, a George Lucas in this, and there's going to be three more sequels <laughs> with an entire new generation, and Bobby's the Obi Wan Kenobi of all this, right? Uh, uh, I'm not giving any idea. If anyone's watching and that happens, I'll take ten percent. Uh, but uh, uh, as Gab's new agent, no. <laughs> uh, here are your two pints, and they just float across the bar. Uh, but. Um, very rarely do you get an opportunity to do that. I mean, you don't. I mean, if you do a piece in, uh, you know, on a theatre or a, a play, that's a completely different thing. Yeah. But to see it against such a a long period of time, was that satisfying for you, or what were you, what were your feelings towards that? Were you excited I, to being able to bring that closure? I, I know. It's, again, it's really weird because you have no. You be off the map. Here be dragons. There's, <laughs> there's just nothing to compare it to. Uh, yeah. So there was no reference point, and nobody even to really speak to you about it. We were all kind of going, "Whoa!" whoa, whoa. Um, you just kind of went with the flow, really. That it was amazing, you know. Because up till then, Velvet Soup, I think, had, had been the longest I'd worked with people. We were a team for about seven years. Yeah, but we worked with people for nearly twenty years, right from the start. Uh, and for it to continue, you know, I mean, because you talk, you know, Faulty Towers is what 12 episodes, 12 episodes, yeah. Bill Game is over 60 odd episodes. And for all the you know, the criticisms that started to happen over the kind of media we have now and social media, and everybody wants their voice to be heard, and it's not as good as it used to be, and it's no this and it's no that. And what like, you try writing one episode, never mind <laughs> writing over 60 episodes, that's still game, um, and also. A lot of people used to say that about older episodes. It's classic, do you know what I mean? And then yeah. time goes by, people go, oh, do you know what? That's one of my favourites. Yeah. <laughs> uh, which is another great sign of the show. I think everybody can name episodes and specific ep episodes and lines and what have you. But I think um, ah, it was weird, you know, because it certainly felt like unfinished business, the way yeah. that it's for a while, uh, and felt like we'd kind of short change the fans a wee bit. And so I always felt kind of, now nah, we've got to the, the, the circle has to be complete uh, for the sake of the fans. And, and I remember meeting Greg for a coffee and he was talking about it. And he's like, yeah, that's what we're going to do. And said, brilliant. I think that'll be brilliant. Although the, the hydro was scary. Yeah. Uh, but then it was like, wow, that kind of blew, blew our minds. And then we came back on telly. So the chance to then come back after that time uh, and the world had changed a lot as well. Very that's much, not, yeah. That's the other thing. You know, those episodes are still game you probably would never get away with now, you know, whether it be language, subject matter, uh, and kind of woke stuff and all that, where people would be like, whoa, clutching the invisible perils about some of the things we used to do. <laughs> um, so I, which we could get away with on stage, but yeah. coming back to TV was different. Um, 
And then for me personally, it was about a year, a year and a half before we knew we were going to finish. I'd said to Greg one morning, uh, we, we were in the van, and I said to him, do you know, Greg, I, I think we should start putting bits of grey in Bobby's wig, you know, because he's just, you know, it's, it's, I'm starting to look ridiculous, you know, I mean, I've just got this big black wig, and the way that we were filming it, things were looking a bit darker, and I was getting older looking, you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Just needed less makeup, I needed more. And, uh, <laughs> so I, and I thought, he just, I think we should age him up a wee bit, just give him a wee bit of grey at the sides, and all that. Yeah. Greg, no. I'd spoken to the makeup girls, and they were like, I agree. And we put in a wee bit, but it wasn't reading. And Greg said, All right. We, we, I, I, if really closely, there is grey in Bobby's hair, but you just don't see it. Much. And uh, and Greg went, no, no, no. Don't want to do that. It's not happening. Uh, because that's how the show ends. And I was like, hey, what are you talking about? Oh, and he had known for a long, long time. He's like, right, how we've always seen it is... And he told me, and he told me what the final scene was. And yeah. we're not absolutely sure, but we're pretty sure this will how it will finish. And I instantly choked up. I just had this big ball in my throat. It was like, oh my god, because I just wasn't expecting it. You know, yeah. you're working in the morning, and I was probably hungover. And <laughs> but I just kind of caught me out and thought, God, that's that's really beautiful. But yeah. it's also really tragic, you know. And you think Bobby never ever moved on. Uh, and we all know that kind of story, the guy who gets stuck there. You know, yeah. stuck there when he was 18, and that's how his life ended. Everybody's yeah. gone, and Bobby's alone, still in the Klansman, still working behind the bar. And there's people go, oh, it's really beautiful, and it's so nice, but it's also quite horrible. <laughs> it's pretty, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's pretty tragic, but quite real. And I, it's, I think so. It's quite it's, heartbreaking. It's, sort of, but, but what a beautiful, heartbreaking way to kind of end it all. You yeah, know. it's it's a different read. I guess it depends on how you. Oh, it, it's it's there for people to perceive. Some people are like, you know, he's exactly where he wants to be, or yeah. he feels he needs to be there, and that's what stops people from moving on. Sometimes they feel like I need to be here. Uh, is he there for you, the viewer? Selfish viewer. Uh, is he there? Uh, <laughs> is, he, is he there for you guys? Uh, oh, that's it. I I thought it was a tremendous end, and I thought everyone. Well, was I, thought battle, it was, I think, it was but really beautiful and really brave. And I thought uh, generally what Ford and Greg did, I thought was incredibly brave. You know, it takes something and decide to walk away yeah. when we could easily have kept going and going and going and going and going. And I'm sure people would have been quite happy for us to do so. But I thought it was fantastic. Going, no, yeah. we we kill it. And this is how we take control and we kill it this way. And then we, we have a big hooli and say goodbye live and that's it. You know, and and then a lot of people were still going, No, you're at it. No, you're at it. You did this before. Like, no, we didn't do it before. We've never done this before. There was there was a break, but we never officially broke. And yeah. It's not really over. I think you'll mm. find it is. <laughs> Kind of felt like it was over, you I, know. It's uh, if um, you saw the live show, it's kind of no, it's done, you know. It's it's done. Done. Uh, and, but I think that that's quite a remarkable, beautiful thing, and I think seals it really nicely. I, I think that keeps it and it's preserved. Yeah. Hopefully, you know. I don't, I don't, and I think it because of the way you guys brought it to a close, it helps preserve it. Like you're saying, will help extend it. Even yeah. even further, you know, it'll be something like people go back. It's like I guess my friend's point about Faulty Towers. There it is. It'll, yeah. it'll ever forever be there. It's, you know, Faulty if there were sixty odd episodes of Faulty Towers, yeah. would it destroy the legacy? Would it and, have and, and, the, the, the humor? And you know? if they brought it back now, That's, well why I, why why tarnish a, a, a perfect thing? I've got to ask you about a couple of things of career, and I realise I've kept you uh, hodgy here for so long. I really appreciate it, Gavin. Right. Really appreciate it. Uh, but I've got a couple of things I need to uh, talk to you about. Uh, first time I ever got to see you on stage performing was when you did Casablanca. Ah. Uh, uh, and so it was a few years ago now, and I remember I remember reading about it because um, it's interesting what you said about you know films making a transition to a uh, stage and, and vice versa I remember going I'm going to go see that this was long before I I was any type of uh, uh, comedic performer and uh, but you, the, there's a rich history that it's interesting that even though at that point I guess you would have done let me think so you would have done Velvet Soup and you would have certainly done some still game oh, by that point yeah, would have been, yeah. yeah we would yeah, have done Casablanca's oh. roughly about 10 years ago now. Nine, well, 10 years ago, 2010, yeah. Yeah, roughly, yeah. 
uh, the first time we did it. It was weird. It, kind of, it was a joke. Uh, another thing that's, again, classic me, really, started as a joke. But right. just, in fact, this contains a, a lot of the things we were talking about uh, and people we've already mentioned. That uh, It was Peter McDougall. And right. the, up in the Orden Moor, they used to do a, a weekly uh, sitcom called West Enders. Oh, and did they? they? Different students from uh, Caledonian Uni. Right. Uh, in the MA TV course, uh, and so they were writing these scripts, and they'd do a weekly kind of soap that you went and watched this comedy soap. So they would have a guest, and amongst it all, they had a guest uh, drunk, and a guest writer every week could appear at some point. Guess who that was? <laughs> <laughs> so Peter McDougall was uh, the writer, uh, and I came in as a drunk at one point, and Peter uh, was very nervous. And they'd had a drink, and he started freaking out a wee bit <laughs> and trying to go off the stage. And I went, Peter, sit down with you, Dan. No, I can't do it, man. And, and just talking a lot of rubbish. And his partner, Morag Fullerton, was there. Uh, so afterwards, we're having a drink, and then I was a, a wee bit in my cups and went outside to have a cigarette. And Morag came up to me, and she was like, I really enjoyed that. And I went, like, all right, right. I said, yeah, listen, you know how they do play pie and a pint downstairs, which for those who haven't heard of it, it's like in a lunchtime theatre in Glasgow. But yep. It's uh, brilliant. Uh, it's produced loads, thousands of new plays and stuff for about 15, 16 years now. And, uh, uh, uh-huh, uh-huh. What do you think? Uh, they do play pie in a pint. They do play pie in a classic, where they take a classic uh, piece of work and cut it down to 55 minutes. Mm-hmm. What do you think I play pie in a movie? Uh, what, what do you mean? It's in, if we take a famous film but cut it down into like 50 minutes or so, I don't see why not. Yeah. No. Uh, what are you think? Casablanca. Aye. Go for it. Go for it. Would you do it? Like day what? You know, Casablanca. What, uh, part? Do, what do you want me to do? You know, in uh, Humphrey Bogart. Aye. Not a problem. Cool. Okay, I'll speak to you later. I'll go and write it. Aye, I'll see you later. Bye. You know. Never thought anything of it. And of course she got in touch with me and uh, I've written that play. Oh God, what? <laughs> right, oh, have you? And uh, came to meet her, give it a read, see, tell me what you think. Oh, aye, okay. Um, who else is in it? No, I read it, uh, and that was it. We kind of, it was bizarre. I mean, all down to Morag, really. It's so clever what she did to condense the movie in, into 50 yeah. minutes and keep the kind of heart of it and respect of it. You know, it's a, a kind of loving homage to it that. Because you're aware you're playing with the family jewels. Uh, yeah, yeah. He's an icon. I mean, Humphrey Bogart's an icon in the movie itself is an icon. If anyone, I, I, I know we don't have time to go into it now, but if you ever get a chance to look through even the production history of Casablanca, yeah. it's fascinating. Yeah. Fascinating. There's Which we also tried to incorporate a wee bit into the show yeah. with facts and, 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 and stuff like that. But yeah, it was through that. It was only meant to run for six days. And you travelled uh, throughout Europe, I think, to you did a yeah, couple of we played various places. We all over Britain. We did the festival a couple of years. Uh, yep. uh, we went to Barbados, went to Paris, uh, and then we we brought it back about two years ago. And then they had a vote, a public vote last last year, year before, right. of uh, the, the the most popular play and, and the five hundred plays of play pine a pint and casablanca won so uh, we brought it back for that as well so yeah which, which was fun but it's brilliant i mean it's it's a real honor to do because you kind of as i say you, you know you're doing something so iconic and the, the thing was that we, we we knew there was laughs and things yeah making a virtue of these three ridiculous actors trying to do this iconic piece of work um but what was really touching is when we made people cry you know, and there was times where you could actually see people still sort of they, they still bought into the romance and, and the state yeah. and playing it, playing those moments for real that, the, you know, it wasn't all for laughs, which was really, really nice. Um, but no, it's been brilliant. Uh, but who would have thought we'd still be doing it nearly 10 years later off and on? I mean, that's, that's crazy. That's crazy. Uh, I mean, I mean, there's so many other. Things. I mean, I'm sitting here with your ID, I, IMDb in front of me. I, I won't, I won't, I won't embarrass you and go through it, darling. <laughs> there is uh, so many wonderful, and incredible things in here, and some stuff still to come up, which is exciting. I, I assume <laughs> you can never tell, like these, these like, because <laughs> it's got like in production editing, and you go, is it? I don't know. Um, uh, apparently, let's see. Uh, I will go through it. But one question I wanted to ask you, because I know you've done the likes of breaking the week. You've, you've. 
stepped into film a few times as well. Yeah. Um, one I've got to tell, ask about, and I've 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 asked you about this gentleman before, and I'm going to ask you because he's my hero. Um, you got to work with Robin Williams. You got to become yeah. friends with Robin Williams, and very rarely in your lifetime do people get to become friends with people that they really, really get to idolise. Uh, I got to become friends with Rowdy Roddy Piper, the wrestler of all people, oh. which is still a, a bizarre one um, to the point that we only got to know each other a couple of years and when he passed. Oh my God, it hit me hard. Yeah. It hit me very, very hard. Uh, and Robbie Williams was a, a, an icon, is an icon of mine. The reason I'm a stand-up, there's no two ways about it, the reason I'm a stand-up, which you don't hear a lot from Scottish people, but you got to work with Robin. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, aye, that, that was a weird one. It, it's a Bill for, and again, a, a lovely Scottish thing, because it was a Bill yeah. Forsyth movie, uh -huh. um, who hadn't done anything for years. Uh, Bill Forsyth is known for Gregory's Girl in Scotland. Yeah. And um, I, again, it was through Bobby, Bobby Carlyle. I'd done a show with Bobby, another show called, uh, the thing that I was talking about earlier, but a poster, Conquest of the South Pole. Yeah. And I had an accident and fractured my spine. And I was kind of recovering and learning to walk again and things like that. And Bobby asked me, there was 14 of us, uh, kind of glorified extras, really. But, uh -huh. they, but they wanted actors because they might have to improvise and improvise with Robin. Okay. Um, and so I asked his on board, and I'm like, yeah, I, of course, Robin. And like, you had know, adored Robin since as far as I could remember, you know, Mark and Mindy, and yeah. it's, you know, Live at the Met. Um, Live at the Met is the perfect stand up special. I don't care what well, anyone says. No, you know, nothing comes close. And um, it, yeah, he was just phenomenal, absolutely. I adored him, was totally in love with, with Robin. So, uh, although we all did the classic, I'll always remember the first day we we're, <laughs> were all waiting at wardrobe. Uh, to get fittings and all that, and a, a car would appear, and everybody's going, Is that him? Is that him? <laughs> <laughs> and his body double would come out or something. And then eventually, when he did appear, he got out, Is that him? Is that that's him? That's him. And everybody went, Like, too cool for school. You know, like, <laughs> not even going to look at him. Yeah. Aye, whatever, Mork. I am. Um, sorry, what's your name? <laughs> oh, no, I, right. Uh, nice to meet you, uh, Robert. <laughs> um, <laughs> there was all that and it was it was just an amazing experience i mean out of 14 actors we had about two arses which isn't a bad going when it comes to actors and, <laughs> and we just had a brilliant time for a fortnight it was unbelievable and within a couple of days i remember phoning my girlfriend uh and at night talking about whatever i'm saying robin or whatever and she's like what and i'm like Ro oh it's robin now is it <laughs> <laughs> i so, and, and he was just everything you'd expect and more you know he was so generous so much fun uh lightning in a bottle so sensitive uh absolutely hysterical could turn it on and off and so the boys kind of punted me forward to him quite a bit right do impersonations and and carry on and so we I, we got to play together a bit which was pretty tough because he was a steamroller <laughs> um <laughs> And I, I think once, just once, you had to kind of be there. It's a long story, but once I managed to top him, uh, and I, I was dying in my arse. We were, were sitting waiting on the tide coming in, and I could feel the boys kind of like willing me on. And it was this Rolling Stones thing. I was doing Mick Jagger, and he was doing Keith Richards. And he kept feeding me lines that I just couldn't come up with him. You know, oh. and he was you know, do you know, do you know, do you remember the time where we, um, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I, and I just would be going, no, that's, <laughs> <laughs> no. All the time, guys would laugh politely, but you could tell them, "Go, aye, aye." But come on, Gav, come on, pull something out of the bag, you know. And eventually, he said something like, uh, "Do you remember the time we had, um, you know, we went fishing and we got some uh, like beautiful trout, and you know, we smoked it?" And I went, "Oh yeah, yeah, it was like brown trout. How come you taste so good, yeah?" <laughs> And thankfully, Robin kind of pissed himself. The boys were like, yes, thank Christ for that. <laughs> but then Robin uh, put his arm around us as we walked away and he went, you know, so, you know, have you, have you ever been to, like, Mick or Keith's? Like, what? No, I know for a while. No. <laughs> we, you know, we don't talk much. We had a bit of fun. No, no since he got that big dog. No, <laughs> no. I'm allergic to cats. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and that was that. And then, I mean, he gave everybody his address and something. If you're ever over, and you're like, aye, of course. 
<laughs> um, and then I went on to do Taking Over the Asylum. Yeah. Uh, and Ken Stott had been in the film. And I was talking about how lovely Robin was, in fact. It's here. Robin sent us these books. It's at the oh. Which are these lovely bound books with your name on it and things. Oh, wow. And uh, he's kind of, he signed it inside. And I was saying how lovely. Um, oh, that's the, wonderful. Of Robin to do that. And Ken kind of looked at me like, what? And suddenly we realised that he didn't do this with everybody, but he obviously loved the group of guys that he worked with and Scotland. Oh, right. Okay. And so it was actually pretty special. And then I went over to the States uh, for the first time ever, was there, and I thought, I'd feel an arse if I didn't. I might as well. What's he got to say? No. He yeah, doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I ended up, I blew him out about five times. What? I, I know, it was ridiculous. Uh, and then we met up and we uh, we had a ball and, and that was it. We kept in touch. I visited him a couple of times. When he was over here, he'd get in touch. He invited me up to Billy Conley's and uh, do up in Aberdeenshire. But I didn't go. Uh, and it was like Steve Martin was there and Eric Idle and uh, I, all these people. But Gav, I, come on! My, my <laughs> arse went basically. Do you remember the brown trout line? <laughs> <laughs> You're a hundum! You're a hundum! <laughs> Palm in my hand! Palm in my hand! Mate. I'd have been fucking terrified! <laughs> exactly, exactly. And he was like, yeah, oh, just come up, you know, come stay, and all that. And, all that. What? But, and of course, the way he talks, you know, it's like, you know, Steve will be there, and Eric, and, but, and it takes you a wee while, and then the penny drops, you think, Jesus, he's talking about, oh no, and I just thought, nah, I can't be in that company, I could make this out. <laughs> anyway, I was in Greg's the other day, and uh, oh, Jesus. <laughs> you know, because it happened for him once, it was the first time I was at his house, and we were sitting, and his, his niece was there, and her boyfriend, and I'd kind of come in the conversation, and uh, Robin and his wife at the time, Marsha, had been away for five days, and they were talking about, oh yeah, we had a great time, it was wonderful. You know, and it was great because the hotel, you know, mom was there and she she was so happy because she got to meet Al and she got to meet and they're rhyming off these people. And I'm quietly just sitting, taking it all in, going, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and it was great. And, you know, the, the wonderful thing was that Claude was there and he was doing a, he, he, my hairdresser. So, and this is Marsha talking, so, so he could do my hair uh, because he was doing Hillary's. So that was great. And that and I'm like slowly going, what? And then the, how they were late, and we were late for the ceremony, but it was fine because as it turned out, the police took us down way to motorcade. So we got there quick enough anyway. Eventually the penny drops that this was the re inauguration of the president, you know. And they're like, I I, I think we're in slightly different leagues here. Uh, <laughs> <I can't... laughs> oh, oh. Mm. Uh, would you have blown that off, it's Gav? Would you switch on for the lights at John Square? <laughs> <laughs> right. I'm busy. I've got I've got to what change that. that. What's that? Yeah. Sometimes the provost is there and all that. Oh, it's it's madness. I need to go down and get new power cards. That meter I don't know if I can fill itself. <laughs> <laughs> Robin. I don't know about you. There's a boy at the end of the road that splits them for you. You get twice the money. It's gonna be <laughs> <laughs> twice the money. That's crazy. Uh, well. Uh, I've, got, I've got so many questions. I've got so many questions, but I feel like I've taken up uh, enough of your time. Right. We'll have to do this again. Maybe it'll be on this. Maybe it'll be somewhere else. There's so much. What have, uh, These times are very weird, Gav. What Have you got anything coming up in the pipeline or are we just kind of waiting to see where this craziness takes? Oh, no, I do have one more thing I want to talk to you about. You said earlier, you've always wanted to be in a band, but you don't have any music talent. Yeah. But you found your way to get into <laughs> one of the biggest bands in Scotland. Colonel uh, Mustard and the Dijon Five. Bunch of boys that I love with all my heart. I think they're just simply fantastic. Uh, Some of the terrible. nicest folk you'll meet in any form of entertainment, really. And uh, you have got to share it. You want to be, I think you've got to be in the videos. Uh, yeah. You've got to be in a video. You've got to be on stage with them. What's it like to finally... I mean, I know you've blown off Robin Williams and uh, probably could have got a wee <laughs> invite to the inauguration <laughs> if you tried. Uh, <laughs> But what's it like to finally get that dream of being in a band? It was cool. It was cool. It's funnily enough, it all happened. It was a day I saw you as well when it was That's... for the Clutha. Yes. Uh, the reopening of the Clutha, and we were uh, having a charity day. And the, yeah. the boys came up 
they were playing. They were the, the last band to play. And I spotted a T-shirt and thought, that's a cracking T-shirt. Oh, the T-shirts and, are cool. And David Blair, cracking name and cracking T-shirt. And David Blair, who's in the band, came up and he said, uh, I'll give you a T-shirt if you kind of punt the band or whatever. And I was like, ah, sure. Uh, and I'd never seen them. And then as soon as they came on, I was like, wow. And a wee bit like still game, musically, in a funny kind of way. Suddenly there was kids in the street. There was grannies and grandas in the street. There was They just were all inclusive and and it was just a brilliant happy celebratory party atmosphere it was just fantastic you know and you're suddenly walking across the street at the Clutha doing a song about road safety together with big beaming smiles in your face and you just come away like what you've made new pals everybody's hugging each other everybody's as high as a kite just feeling great and you thought who does that what that this is an amazing experience this is just how music should be done, people posing about, dressed in black, trying to look cool all the time or whatever, do you know what and I mean? The, the like, live experience with them as oh, well is such fun. Live bands, you know, and it's all about inclusion, and, and they, I mean, they're quite political as well, but it's about yeah. inclusion and fun uh, and enjoyment, and uh, they're just brilliant. So out of that, they said, would you do one of our videos? It's like, yeah, and, and it just rolled on, and they just keep getting me in for, and again for things. I kind of became like the the, the geriatric bears of the band. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I have done videos with them. I'm now, I think, the new album, which is due for release very soon, I'm on one of the tracks of the new album. I do a bit with them. I've made it onto that now. You've done uh, it. So I... Um, well, I, well, God, now I'm keeping you back. But, I, but those kind of things have led on because now dreams have come true of talking about being with bands that I ended up uh, playing my heroes, sort of playing with Bowie's band and all that as well. So, wow. So I, all these things have sort of slowly, one thing's led to another, cause, which all connected with the Mustards, because they did, the, the first time they played the Barland. Yeah, you were there. I was there and accepted an award on behalf of David Bowie, who'd just passed away, and Bowie's yeah. my big hero. And that's one thing led to another through that, which is... A long story for another day, perhaps. But oh. I passing on the award to Bowie's guitarist, and it's oh, all went bum 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 bum, and I ended up meeting his band, and then I ended up being invited to sing with his band, and you know, so all these kind of things. So I, it's, there's been loads of sort of weirdness that happens. Well, but I, but so certainly Mustard's album's coming out. I'm doing well, a Radio Four historical drama in the next week or so. Fantastic. Uh, and hopefully another good thing that we're working on. Uh, just this morning, actually, that trying to bring in a wee Christmas story uh, with a friend in Ireland got in touch with us who's written a wee children's Christmas story that we're recording and hope to punt to raise money for homelessness during Christmas. Oh, so uh, I all all for free. Me, Lost Straight Jackets, another band that I love, are uh, doing the background music for it. And we hope to raise as much as we can for homeless uh, during Christmas. Because if well, yeah. anybody we think we're having it bad during the pandemic, but uh, if anybody's having it bad, it's bad enough being homeless, but then put yourself in this shit. <laughs> well, uh, you know something, here at Broadcast, we'll definitely make a donation. We'll grab that as well. And of course, a, a shared charity that we both uh, uh, have a, a lot of time in our hearts for is obviously some of the mental health charities like some Mind and yeah. uh, There's Rain as well. Uh, uh, it's You're still involved with these guys? I, I, as much as I can, still try and do as much uh, kind of mental health stuff. Uh, you know, I did that short film a couple of years ago, which uh, was scary, but brought back a hell of a lot of positive feedback and got, mm -hmm. a lot of people came forward, and including a lot of people in the business, uh, surprisingly, who still didn't want to go public, but I was surprised at how many people kind of said, oh, thank you, or I've actually been, you know, help people come out a bit. So uh, I, and especially, time, again, times we find ourselves in at the moment, you know, what is yeah. creating more damage, uh, you know, mental health during this pandemic, etc. I know that my brain is certainly turning into soup at times and find it yeah. hard to struggle and the nature of it isolating us and alienating us and uh, which brings you know a lot of time in your own head etc so um i all the more reason we have to kind of talk to each other and communicate and reach out and all these things so, and other organizations like brothers in arms and, yeah uh, gosh can't remember others off the top of my head um mind the men uh got quite a few that are involved with anything i can really to draw attention to things like that because it's it's important, ever more so. 
Jackson. Very much so. Very much so. It's uh, um, particularly where we all are just now. Well, yeah. look, I look forward to hearing what happens when you go to Mick Jagger's house and tell him the David Bowie story. <laughs> Because you'll be all loaded up and ready to go, uh, <laughs> and uh, I know, like you're in a band, and you know it's who knows. Inevitably, when we have uh, still game the next generation, <laughs> which which just is either the best or worst idea. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Either someone right now goes, "Boys are genius." <laughs> it's, uh, we'll have a chat out. But listen, uh, I would do this again a hundred times. This was so much fun, uh, Gav. Of course, people can find you on social media. I know you're on. Uh, you still on Twitter? You still on the Twitter? People can still find you on the Twitter. And... I think you get me on Gav the number one at Twitter and Instagram and all the rest yeah. of that, guys. I love the, the Instagram. Love, cause... Do you love the Twitter? I love the Twitter. I love the Twitter. Oh, I, love the Twitter. I love your Instagram because every now and then you'll put up... that. That's one of the things that makes me say, well, we'll have to do this again, even if it's just sitting in a pub one day. Um, it's just every now and then there'll be a picture coming up and you go, hang on, where the fuck did you do that? You know, they sort of just... <laughs> You're so you're so casual. You're so humble. It's like, it's, who's this in this picture? And it just always looks so cool. Um, I could do this a hundred times, like I say. But anyway, I'll pop you into the green room just now, and I will finish up the broadcast, and then we'll have a wee goodbye chat. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, whatever you're watching, uh, you're the wonderful Gavin Mitchell. Uh, that's all we've got time for in this episode of broadcast. We're a wee bit longer tonight, but. Do you know, I think it was certainly worth it, don't you? Make sure to check out everything Gab's doing and, of course, the charities that he mentioned as well. Uh, we will put the links in the videos. And, of course, make sure to check out everything that's going on on Broadbeard social media as well. We're all about body positivity here, so make sure to check out some of the charities we work and some of the mental health charities we work with as well. And buy yourself some products. We're on the run up to Christmas. Get yourself a beard oil. Get yourself a, a, a snood, a neck snood. I can't remember what they're called. A T-shirt. I can stick with a T-shirt. Get a T-shirt wax, all that type of thing. Uh, that's all we've got time for. We're going to have another tremendous guest next week. Don't forget, you can listen on Spotify and iTunes. Hey, YouTube people are people still on the people people might be on the people if you're on the people broadcast them there don't worry about it I'm a Billy Kirkwood uh, make sure this is the whole thing can I finish the show without actually looking at my computer monitor can I do it can I do it oh. ah fuck <laughs>